Um, very welcome to this lecture on big data and language technologies. And what we do here in the first session is a, this is a reading session where we bring background technologies. And afterwards, there will be a practical session where you will learn further working with the APIs. Our ambitious goal was, and I hope that you like this goal, is that you understand what we are doing here. And um, at least on the Weimar side, we have to write uh, reports, seminar texts, and these require that you understand what we are talking about in the sense of learning technologies, regression, and the mass behind this. And deep learning, to say it simple, is nothing more than complicated regression. It, in fact, it isn't so complicated. It is very um, specialized in that sense that the deep learning technologies are able to learn very complicated functions by learning many exceptions. And hence, it is very useful to understand how regression works at all. We started the reading, the course uh, two lectures before with a certain classification task where we wanted to predict positive or negative sentiment for a review. Probably you recall this. And um, this classification task is solved with a regression method. And even the more complicated tasks like language generation are solved with regression technology. Neural network technology at heart is regression technology. And um, what I bring today is the first introduction and it is for the Weimar people probably a short recap of regression technology. However, it is very compact and um, I try to make it as understandable as possible. What I would also like is that you interrupt me or us, let's say Michael, Lucas, Martin and me, if you have questions in between, because we are very well prepared. We discussed these slides a few hours, and we are happy if you have questions with, which we can directly answer. We will also we just you... shortly yes. check in here if anyone doesn't have a mic, just write in the chat, and then I will relay the message um, or reach it out to Beno. Yeah, very, very good, Lucas. And um, it's uh, very okay for me if you interrupt me. It's not a problem at all. Am I still uh, well understandable? Is this okay? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay. This material which, which we present now is a compilation of material which, we, which you find in detail on our web pages. And I want to first point you to this place so that you can um, read this or get details if you're interested in this or if you need this information later on in the seminar. You go to our web pages, bbs.de. There you go to lecture notes. And in lecture notes, there you go to the machine learning collection. And from this collection, we have selected about 250 slides, which form the regression part from first principles. And these are presented now, and you can Find the details here, for instance, here's regression to classification, overfitting, or logistic regression. What you see here is a two-class problem. Yeah? We have these green points in some dimension. They are projected here in the two-dimensional space. And we have these red points. And the idea is to separate them or to say, if you get a new point, does it belong to the greens or to the reds? And do you see this looks like a complicated curve, but it is from a high parameter space. And we see only two parameters. In reality, this is by far more complex. But already this is a complicated nonlinear function. And the question is, we are interested in this green line here, and we get this green line by modeling this yellow carpet, yeah, which you see here. This yellow carpet is a regression function that was computed. And the neural network computes this function, and a certain line in this, namely there was 
all values are zero, gives us this separation line. And what you see here, this is a kind of arrow curve also, only in two dimensions in these two parameters, which you see here. And during learning, we might start here at some high arrow and then move down to this minimum. This happens during training, as a, for instance, back propagation algorithm. What you see here should not make you afraid. Here you see a compact formula of a neural network. Compact means it is a complete truth. There's nothing hidden. This is a two layer network. There's a hidden layer and an output layer and they are computed. This will be introduced in the next session. We want that you get the math from the first principles, because if you run into problems during training, you have to understand at which screws you have to, to pull and to, uh, which things you can change to improve this. This is a so-called loss function. The loss function tells us how we compute the differences. This is a squared loss function, but we could also take cross entropy or something other. This loss function is accumulated over all output units. And what you see here is the deri derivative of the loss function. And also this is computed. It means when you train a neural network, you design the network by providing the structure. You tell which kind of loss function you want to have. And the remainder is then completely automatic. Other questions until this point? No. Okay. We now become very simple again. We call this supervised learning because we get input output pairs, or we say in statistics, predictor response pairs. A predictor here, a predictor vector, that means a vector of predictor variables, tells us something about the object which we want to classify. This can be a letter a review, a text, a car, something. And the, and the y here, this is a value which we want to compute. Is this sentiment positive or negative? Or is this a humorous text or not? And we consider these classification tasks. Is this something yes or no, zero or one, as regression. I will show you how we do this. Today, we will start with the basics, understanding how regression works, but move forward until logistic regression, the so respective loss functions, until overfitting. These are all elements that you need to understand. The material which is coming now is meant to be completely understood, more or less completely. And if you have troubles to understanding this, don't hesitate to ask us. And I would also ask uh, Lucas, Michael, or uh, Martin to explain things in the background or to interrupt me if I jump too quick over too complicated things. This is very helpful for the students because they learn from our discussion much more than if I'm giving here a long monologue. Yes. That means I would like you to take this chance to ask things. And uh, you don't need to worry. If you can ask questions which I cannot answer, this is also fine. Don't uh, uh, hesitate with this. And if you think I should go more fast, you can also say this. It is not a problem to make things fast. It is a problem to make things understandable. What you see here are examples. Examples of the vector x, and then a question which is not answered here, is this customer which is described here, is this worthy of getting a loan? And uh, this information, for instance, what we see here is captured in this pairs, this input-output pairs. The regression setting is different from the classification setting only in this factor that the output here is a class. That means it's a nominal domain with very few 
elements. Usually we take zero and one, while this here is the plane of the real numbers. And our examples are formed from this cross product. In a very simple model, in the linear model, we take the values of the descriptions, weight them somehow, simply add them and compute something. In vector notation, this looks like this. Since every vector is a column vector, we write a T for transpose to denote that this W transpose uh, becomes a row vector. And so we see here the so-called scalar product. And all operations happen or take place in the scalar product space. There are certain mathematics behind this, which allows us certain things, among others, the tensor flow computations. If we now take all examples, we have, look here, n examples, n examples. We can, for each example, look whether our ground truth which we got here or here matches our computation. And then this difference then is accumulated over all examples. And if it's a squared like here, we get the residual, sums, residual sum of squares, the RSS. Mm, I know, I think it's, Dunya has a question there. Yeah, sorry, I, I was wondering, what is meant with ground truth? Ground truth is what we ask people, what is the truth behind a certain thing? If we learn, and what we do here is supervised learning, I go to this because this is very interesting and important to see. We need some person who tells us, this is the ground truth, this is the truth. This is a letter which has a positive sentiment, or this is the news which is fake news. And this knowledge is transferred into the machine. And the machine tries to model a function and compares the computation of this function with this so-called ground truth. This here is a ground truth. And most part of machine learning, or large part, is concerned with getting these examples. This so is so-called corpus collection, corpus formation, or knowledge acquisition. Normally, this is not treated in courses, but um, in a course like this, we should very well know about this, that we need a solid ground truth. In the example which Lucas presented and Niklas presented at that time, we also had this ground truth. Perhaps you didn't see this. They also showed you a matrix which is processed. And this matrix was had in each row the description of the object and the ground truth. So um, another word for this, in case you have a classification task, would be the ground truth label. Um, yeah. Maybe that clarifies it a bit more. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and to, to, to recall the, the movie review example from the first tutorial that Lucas showed, right? We had the, the text of the review that would correspond to the axe here through some intermediate representation, of course. And then we had the column where it said, is this a positive review or a negative one? And that would correspond to the Y in this, in this case. So uh, we would only check against this ground truth after we run the predictions? Yes, okay. this is our task. And we call this difference, this is the important thing which we later will call loss. And if you call about loss functions, we call about ideas, how to interpret this difference. And uh, you should know this very well because in the API, you get about 10 possibilities to choose this. And you should think about that these interpretations concern what do we do with this difference? And this is the idea of Gauss, which is quite popular today, but we have better things. He simply said, we take the square. This has a few reasons also from the mathematical standpoint, it, which leads to the Gauss-Markov theorems. And also with regard to 
unique optimum in the linear case, but uh, normally you are completely free to interpret this difference. Mm. But, but maybe to motivate a bit what's I think coming next, um, but Benno, if you just compute the loss after you already set up the network, after you have pre-initialized some weights, and after you put in the inputs, how is the network trained at all? Like um, if you can only compute the loss after you already estimated some network weights, how do you in the end um, even learn something out of this? Maybe this could be the question that arises in, in yeah. everyone's head now. And yes, we will, we will show this in detail, but um, the way you, you dis, uh, describe this, um, we can develop a form for this loss. Here, here you see this. this. This green carpet, which you see here, is the loss shown over two parameters. And um, what we see here, the minimum of the loss is here. This is the objective where we want to go. And the neural network can now compute the so-called gradient. And this is where the gradient methods, which will come next week, come in. It can compute in which direction should we go, should the weights be changed so that we come closer to this minimum. And here you see, here's our loss, the RSS, for instance. And this is for the answer to Niklas, yes? Thank you, yes, thanks. Okay, so um, don't be afraid that it goes with this um, speed or slowness further. No, it does not. Uh, we, we have certain uh, sections and we will now take one step after the other so that you get kind of set of building blocks, which you then can put together. Um, the slides, which you find in the internet, but also these here have explanations where you can read details, which I've talked about. For instance, what the RSS is in the so-called remark slide. Yes, he, he is it called a, what a residual is or what a loss is and this, the loss interpretation. I, skip over these text slides. They are like more like a book. They are meant for your private um, reading. This is for an illustration what happens in the two-dimensional space. What we see here is for a certain value x, let's say this could be the number of words or a certain personal property like the weight or the height of a person. There we get a certain value y. Here is our y. You should completely understand this. this there's, there's no magic behind this. And this point here, it means the connection of this value x with this value y. This is what we call a training pair. On This is the ground truth here, in effect. And if you see these one, two, three, four, eight points with ground truth, we can think this, this here is a good approximation of, of this, what happens here. And if we now characterize this line here with weights, then we do this in a moment here. We characterize this line with weights. Then you've already learned, if you have computed this line with a computer, um, how to process this input x such that we can say something about the possible y. And if, we, if I take this certain value x, xj, yeah, if I take this xj, perhaps this is new, or I want to look what our function does with this, our function returns for this xj, this value here. And then you see the true value here, this uh, yj here, this is different. And this residual is a kind of error. And this error here, this is counted for all points. This is a graphic illustration of what you've seen before. Maybe we can quickly map this back to the uh, movie review example. So you um, see that this is essentially the, the simplest possible way of, of uh, formulating a regression problem like this. 
So in this case, that would mean that we have represented each text by a single number. So that takes something arbitrary, like the number of words, for example. And then each of these gray points in the scatter plot would correspond to one movie review. And the value on the y-axis uh, would be the, the true uh, score of the review, let's say, right? If we are predicting a uh, real valued quantity. So that means X is one number and Y is one number. And in that case, the regression model looks like this, like a, like a line with two parameters. Yeah, so, thank you, Michael. And it's not just so stupid to, to count the words. I recall that uh, the classification of the Wikipedia articles which are featured Mm -hmm. The strongest feature is the number of words. There is a famous article size methods, methods and this, uh, this, this uh, taking on the number of words as predictor gets a very high quality of decision. Okay. What um, we see here is um, if we do this with a direct met method, this is only to remind you that you, if you think you have seen this somewhere in the school, yes, this is right. You have seen this somewhere in the school. It's called the minimum of uh, minimization of um, squares, Methode der kleinsten mal quadrate. And uh, this is exactly what you have learned at some point. It's not a difference. It's exactly this idea of curves. And um, this is the error curve. Now for the simple case, and if we want to find out the weights here, W, then we have to move down this line. And how is this done? This can be done with a direct method, like you learned in the school. Well, this comes quickly to an end. The, the best methods at the moment can process about 10,000 variables. We do it normally. This is an iterative method. And here I bring you a first algorithm, the so-called LMS algorithm. The LMS algorithm is quite old, but from its mechanics, it makes completely sense to understand this. This LMS algorithm optimizes the problem. That means it brings us a vector that comes to the weight so that we have a small error with regard to the squared error measure. And um, I would like you to understand this because we will take this scheme until uh, up to the level of deep learning um, networks. We have a similar scheme. And the scheme starts as follows. It takes these examples which contain descriptions and ground truths and then takes some random weights, like Niklas pointed out at the beginning, because we don't know nothing at the moment, chooses some examples, an arbitrary one, and computes something. And of course, this must be nonsense, because these values here are random, and we do a random computation with these features. What should happen? Nothing useful. And we then compare this thing, which might be nothing useful, with the ground truth and get some delta. And this delta, this is an important information. We use this delta to change our values. This is done here. And we repeat this until we are happy. We call it convergence, which is not important at the moment how we measure this, but this is all what we do. And this very simple method solves the problem of the optimization which you have seen we found this very simple method helps to go down here. This very simple method finally finds this line. Okay. What you have seen now that we are able to learn such a method, uh, to apply such a method, to learn weights, to get this line here. But what you see here is that this line computes as values from the real number line. And that we have differences here. And in fact, finally, we are not interested in a real value function, 
But what if we want to do classification, we are interested in a function with very few values, namely our class labels. And here comes the following observation, which I found very enlightening, namely that these binary values, minus one and plus one, they are also real valued. That means we can misuse our algorithm, which is perfectly to do this line for, for regression to do also the classification job. It looks a bit weird because the farther you go out, the worse does the fit get. This is clear. But in fact, this is what we do. And this is, in fact, again, I have to say this, also what deep neural networks do. More smarter methods, this is clear, more smarter functions, but it hardly do this. And our decision rule now simply becomes finding out when to say, when should we go to the left? And when should we go to the right? This can also be translated. When is the sign of this function positive? Then is it negative? While regression gives us the real numbers, classification gives us the sign. This is the important second thing to learn. First, we use regression. Second, if we want to apply regression to classification, we take the sign. Of course, there are some problems with this, namely the outlier thing or other things, but we re repair them step by step. The basic idea still remains the same. Are there questions for this? No. Should I hurry more or is it okay to speed? This question goes to Mike. Maybe, maybe one question would be that this is the case for a binary classification, but can yeah. you map uh, regression to multi-class classification, for example, four or five classes? Because then um, the sign method breaks down. Yeah, we can. Mm, there are two answers to this. At first, uh, you can reformulate, you learn this machine learning every K class problem to a two class to, to a number of two class problems by separating one class and the rest. Yeah? And this way you are already done with this. Uh, what is also possible is that we, we will do this later on with the multi-layer perceptrons. We will directly map the output onto more than two classes, namely on, onto K classes. We will directly train not on zero and one, but uh, onto a one hot vector, which is then combined with a softmax function or something like this. But I that don't want to make it too complicated here. Um, you can reformulate a, a K class method to a two class problem always. This is not the point. And in the, the end, point? I think, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah in, yeah, in the end, I think this is also how it's done. Even if you use the softmax, then you still, um, for, for each of those K classes, you still um, solve the true class problem even with the softmax. So both methods that you just described for those uh, who are already familiar with this fall together to the same argument or, or to the same point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's... Would have been my the, the, well. the point which makes this learning so complicated, um, the, the class learning so complicated, is that we, if we have one, uh, two, or three, or four classes, is that the relation between the classes cannot be exploited. Um, to a bit mathematical background, when we do a, um, a regression problem, our output is um, the algebraic structure of a field, and we have the topology information. We have we can form series and we can form limit values. We can have left and right and smaller and environments and closeness. This all is a way if we work with zero and and one or with with an, a number of problems. And this is is the problem in the learning situation. And the number of classes does it not make more complicated? It starts to becoming complicated if you go from the regression 
to the classification. This sign brings uh, the problem and um, machine learning technology or in the APIs that you have at your disposal, there are many solutions to, to make this smart. We want in this course that you understand the problems, and that you understand why the choices that you have can have certain effects. And we don't want you to play with these APIs. Yes, at the beginning a bit, we would like you to make this very theologically or purposefully if you change things. And don't worry if you don't understand everything at the beginning. At the moment, this talk is to organize the knowledge in your head. Okay. Um, I go now uh, do the same in, in uh, three dimensions with two features. Michael said here, this is a number of words. And this could be the number of stop words. <laughs> it means a certain subset of these words. And we can apply this in two dimensions. This means here we have our negative examples. Again, you see the ground truth here. And here the positive examples. And um, now our function y has three weights. And here you see the, the yellow carpet again, which you saw in a very complicated form at the beginning of this course, at the beginning of this hour when I started. And this yellow carpet is our regression function. And uh, here this line is a line which tells us if we are above we are positive. If the values that are computed are below zero, we belong to the negative class. And again, you see what we do here. We simply take the sign, and this is our classifier, already trained, already learned. It means you, you were already able in your school to do machine learning. You didn't know this. You could take the Gauss algorithm apply it to, instead of uh, real numbers, to zeros and ones, and have learned this. And I want you to see this simplicity, because it is in that way, from its principle, so simple. If we then project the positive and negative examples into the feature space, you see a separating line. And this is a famous line you have often seen negative examples, positive examples, and there's a line. And you might have asked where this line comes from. The line does not come from heaven. The line is not moved some here around. No, this is a line which comes from this regression. It's only projected into the input space. That's all. We call this discrimination line. And if we go even higher here, we have dimension number three, we get a hyperplane. This is the so-called hyperplane. If you have read this, I guess you have read this quite often. This is a hyperplane. Okay. Um, this is a, was the next was uh, the building block for for this part. If there are questions, I am happy to learn. Otherwise, I will step to the next building block. No questions. Everything is clear. Good. Perhaps you recall, perhaps Michael can help me. We did in the example with the review movies, a kind of embedding, pre-processing step. I don't know exactly how you called it, Lucas, where the input um, vector was transformed into something with a so-called matrix. And this computation of this matrix, this weight, weighting of the features that you computed from the reviews, this forms some kind of embedding. And in fact, this forms some kind of representation learning. We learn how to take certain features and to do something with them. And this was also done from the very beginning from people who work with these regression functions. This kind of representation, which you learned or we learned in the example by this matrix embedding, can also be done by hand. And this is how we do this quite often. We do this by instead taking our features as singleton, we multiply them, or we take a square root 
or the logarithm, it means we do something with them. We take not the features at their vanilla form, but we process them somehow. And what we what you uh, see here, this is some kind of representation forming, and this makes sense if you know what to learn. These representations, sorry, you see them here, is expressed by the function phi. And we are still in a regression situation and learn these weights. Hence, it was also in the example that Lucas presented at that time, a pre-processing step. And he processed this function phi implicitly with a matrix. What we can do with this is very impressive. For instance, here, if we want to separate the pluses from the minuses, we cannot do this with a straight line. We need a circle. And if we transform these features, which you see here, feature one and feature two, according to the circle formula, yeah, x1 squared plus x2 squared is, uh, gives one, then we exactly learn this linear regression. Keep this in mind, this is linear regression. We can learn in the feature space in the embedding space, this, limit, this limitation boundary. And this is fantastic. We can learn everything. The problem is we don't know what to learn. And hence, Lucas did this, let the machine look at this. Yeah. With the backpropagation algorithm that he applied as an example, the embedding also was trained. But this is, uh, you did this all automatically, perhaps or without knowing that you did this, but you did a lot of complicated things. And uh, with this reading here, we want to give you background about what you did. Okay. This was this building block. The next building block, logistic regression, brings us a step closer to neural networks. Maybe before that, we can have a question from the chat here. What's the difference between this linear regression and support vector machines from Arthur? Ah, this is a very good question. Um, I'm happy about this question. Support vector machines um, are often demonstrated in highly um, in high dimensional spaces. Um, with regard to the expression, um, this is called the kernel trick in support vector machines. Um, the difference in support vector machines is not the kernel trick, which you see here somehow, since I knew that I wanted to have a circle. The, uh, the importance is that the error function in support vector machines is computed uh, completely differently. Support vector machines are in that sense very interesting, since they do not solve a regression problem. Support vector machines base on, are based on the um, risk minimization theory of Wapnick. And uh, Wapnick says the best line I can I can give you uh, go a few steps back for this question because it's, this is a very good question. He says, uh, wait, wait, uh, this uh, I take this here. Wapnick uh, and other risk minimization ideas say the best line between two such sets should maximize this distance here. And they do not think about a regression, not at all. They, they, they work completely in the input space. And they model this distance problem, which I show you here, we want to maximize this distance with a linear optimization problem. And this is a fundamental difference. That means support vector machines do not solve regression, but solve a um, linear optimization problem. And this is a different mathematical approach. This is really something different. And in our lecture, this is also a different chapter. And anyway, now to come back what you might have had in your mind, we see in these images with this complicated separation lines, often with support vector machines. And what support vector machines do or can do very easily, there is a so-called Mercer theorem that uh, helps us to say that this is possible what we do, they can automatically 
transform or suggest a higher feature space, the so-called kernel in a higher dimension, to find such separating planes. Um, for this, you should take a more abstract view on what you see here. If you look at this circle here, not in two dimensions, but into one, two, three, four dimension, it becomes a plane. And what we have learned here are the weights of a linear function, that means the hyperplane. We have learned a hyperplane in the fourth dimension, which we cannot imagine at the moment. It's a so-called cataract. Cataract, and we cannot see this. This is very, if, if you are interested in this, you could look at the fantastic uh, movie Extra Stella. They show it how to Tesseract could look like, but this is very complicated to see. And support vector machines bring a theory to do this um, transformation into the higher uh, space automatically. This is very interesting theory. I hope this gives you some connection to what we see here should not make things more complicated. You should also learn that at heart, support vector machines and these regression methods here have the same power. We cannot say that one is more powerful than the other. Support vector machines do not suffer from outliers so quickly. This is because of the mathematical optimization. They have other advantages, but at heart, um, there are linear classifiers in a high dimensional space, all of what we're doing here. And I have to admit, even the deep learning machines on this. Yeah, did you, is this a, was this okay? Or did you, do you want to have more, more information about this for the moment? So thank you. Oh yeah, I didn't see this, okay. Yeah, perhaps the others, Michael, Lucas or Niklas would like to add something, but you don't need to. I would agree, this was clear. Next building block. The next building block brings us closer to a function which we is our basic function element in neural networks, namely the logistic function. You will see this in a moment. Sigma, this is a sign for this. I would like to uh, as I always start uh, with um, recap our setting. We are giving a set of examples. These examples consist of descriptions, which are from the R to the power of P. And we have the ground truths. This is the most important and most expensive thing to get. And uh, Google acquires this while we are browsing. Others like our group has to pay a lot of money to crowdsourcers. And again, uh, other companies also spend money. But this is, um, this is very difficult to get here. And if the people say to make money out of data, they always mean this here. The mathematics is something you can get via the internet in, in a few hours. But this, this is what Google has uh, yeah, as a unique selling point. And this is what people make nervous. What we now do here, is in our learning task, we, we want to fit the examples like we did before. And before we used um, a, lo a linear function and now we will use a logistic model function. This is what we did before. You see here this linear function. And uh, this is again, the multiplication of the row vector of the weights times the column vector of the features. This is a scalar product. Uh, I repeat this because Martin told me not all of you had this mathematical background and I find it so essential that I like to repeat this. This is a scalar product here. And the linear regression only does these scalar products, that's all. And we see here, this is a learned classifier. Now, if we are right from this point, we belong to the plus. If we are left, we belong to the minus. But uh, we see also problems. If you have such data like we see here, this is an outlier. But probably it's not an outlier, perhaps it's data which is valuable. If we would now apply linear regression, our point would just something like here, and they would do a lot of misclassifications. We can do better. Yeah, I see this. This is 
not good at solution. We can do better. We can restrict our function to only be, be, be between zero or minus one and plus one or zero and one. And it takes this form. And this is the so-called logistic function, or sigmoid function, which is this form. One divided through one plus e to the power of minus z. And here you see z. And here you see sigma of z. And here you see our idea which we had before, the linear regression. And what we now will do is we will plug in this scalar product into z. This is the idea. And this is our logistic model function. Don't be confused. It takes, it starts with an x. That means an element from the r to the power of p or p plus one. And it maps it onto zero or one or onto this interval zero one. That means what you see here is still the z axis. And this function here can be interpreted in a certain way, namely as follows. Don't be shocked here. The interpretation is here. We plug in a value and say y of x is the estimated probability that the class is one. That means if we now look at our curve here, and I take this value for z, means w times x, I see that for this point, the probability that this value should get a one is 0 0.8. Our ground truth says this is one, and our function says this is 0 0.8. And you see that this, um, function closely goes to plus one here and zero here. And even outliers are not a problem because they, were, they are very nicely fitted here. The further, further you go out, the closer it gets to one or to zero here. I have a technical yeah? comment. Um, yeah. I think we see when you draw, we see the result is blue lines, yes. Yeah. But we do not see when you say here and point. Ah, I see. Thank you, for, thank you for for telling me this. Um, if I knew, would have known this uh, before. Thank you for telling this. I hope it, it just occurred to me also just now because you said it a lot in, in repetition and here and here and here and I I, I saw nothing. And this is I suppose what yeah, others yeah. said too. Yeah. Dear students, please annoy. Tell this if this happens, because we are happy if you understand, not if you sit there. This is, uh, this is our, our message. Okay, uh, back. This is the sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function has this interpretation. We give this, this interpretation. In the slides you can read on the internet, there's also the pro and con and the difficulties of doing this. But we're telling that something is a probability measure, which is at heart done here, can be done if the probability measure um, conditions are fulfilled. And if we take this as probability that certain elements belong to a certain class, we also can now estimate whether new elements belong to this class or not. And we can not only give this class, we can also say something about the class probability or class membership probability, which is a, which is a terminus technicus for this. Very nice function, very powerful function. And the question which we now uh, have to ask ourselves 
if you get these examples, and these examples are these uh, red points and these green points, how do we get the weights that the function looks exactly so that the error is minimum, that we have not such a function or such a function. These are all sigmoid functions. They don't help us. We need the function or which we had before this year. How do we get these weights? And we saw before the LMS algorithm gives us a weight for the linear regression. And there's also a kind of algorithm which gives us a weight for this logistic model function. And the surprise is that these two algorithms look very, very similar. The derivation of these algorithms is given on the slides in the internet. Here we show only the results. Um, the results, as a result, sorry, um, before I do this, um, the result, namely the optimum weight, is found by optimizing this function. And how this is done, this is not shown here. What I would want you now to understand is to learn this function, you need a training algorithm. This training algorithm takes starts with a random set of weights computes the loss, adapts these weights, and so on and so on. And the weight adaptation step, this is a bit different to the LMS algorithm, but not so different. At first sight, these two algorithms look the same. Here's an illustration of what happens. Again, we are in the two-dimensional feature space. Here are our negative examples, here are our positive examples, and this is the result of a linear regression, and this is the result of the logistic regression. And the yellow carpet, as you see it, is exactly the carpet that is computed. And what you then also see, although this is such a curve, not a line, this separating thing here is still linear. which also means that the power of logistic regression is not higher than that of linear regression. This is crazy to understand. This is a linear classifier. What this classifier does better than the, the simple regression model that we presented before, it can better process these problematic cases. It has a better convergence rate probably, or it brings the line to a better position, but it hard. It's a linear classifier. Many people think this is a nonlinear classifier because it's a nonlinear function, but this is not true. The decision is still this year. Is the value smaller or larger than 0 0.5? Here you see the algorithm and um, like the algorithm scheme before, it needs an example set. It initializes the fades randomly. It picks some example set, some example from the set, computes its y value, compares it to the ground truth, and adapts the weight. And the weight adaptation is a bit different, but not much. The algorithm looks so similar to the other that it can easily be confused. This algorithm has compared to the LMS algorithm also the difference that this is a kind of batch algorithm. This is uh, also shown here, but I don't want to bring too much information at the moment. Batch oh, means... Ah. 
I think, at least for me, the audio is still fine. So, for yeah. me as well, yeah. Jonas, uh, maybe we should answer in the chat then. If, if you want to learn or understand these things, take the time and compare these two algorithms. They're at heart not so difficult. The, the problem with this is to prove that they are correct and that they have certain um, optimization criteria which are met. But um, we want you uh, to understand the basic mechanism. Namely, again, such algorithms are behind the deep learning thing. And you should understand where your problems are if you do deep learning. In, in, in deep learning uh, to, or in multi-layer perceptron learning, this step here is replaced by the so-called back propagation thing, but that's all. Michael, uh, if you find it too hard that I say this, <laughs> you can intervene, of course. But uh, um, No, I think for now this is uh, a good explanation. Okay. And I think we will go deeper into this later. Yes. Um, okay. This, I guess, was the third or fourth building block. <clears throat> yeah, of course, course. you're welcome. Uh, for finding the residual uh, near the red, red line, you uh, subtract the probabilities uh, from ground truth or you turn it to the zero and one thing? Um, yes, no, no, I take the probabilities, yeah. These are Do you please repeat the question? Thank you. Yes, ah, sorry, yeah. Okay, the question was the following. Um, if, if I compute this difference here, what is the value y of x? Is, the, is this a probability? Yes, this is a probability uh, divided by 100. Yeah, if you just, if it's 0 0.5, 0 0.7, or 0 0.8. Is this exactly? Ah, sorry, that there are so many lines. Of, it's exactly the value that you get here. Here's the x. Yeah, sorry. So I, here's the x. Here's the y, and this value is taken. That's all. Because in the next slide, you said uh, we classified based on, uh, for example, it's bigger than half, it's one. So we don't use the classification here. We use the uh, exact probability. No? Yeah, we use the exact probability here. This is necessary to compute the gradient. <laughs> okay. No, classific we, we use except probability. Yeah. He asked whether we use except probability or the sign. No, we use except probability. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, a short break or should I continue? This was the fourth building block. The next building block will illustrate the mechanics of loss functions. I think we have until half past three until the next uh, session starts, right? Yeah, but this is too much. I would say too much material. Yes. Uh, if, if I fill it completely, I would say yeah. I will do the the loss thing now, and uh, then uh, they have we have provided a lot of information to 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 take more complicated readings also or to take the, the information from the internet, so the blog posts, or the books. What we have developed for you is a kind of scheme. How does learning works? And this is um, logistic regression. We call it in a nutshell. We start with data. You see the ground truth data here. We have a task, binary classification, clear. We chose a model function. This could be a linear one, but in logistic regression, we choose the sigmoid model function here. We need an optimization objective. I don't know whether you can read this. It's a bit small. It's a so-called loss function here. And we need an optimization approach. And one is a BGD, which I showed you, but there are also better, uh, better algorithms. And these are algorithms which you'll find all in your API. We stepped over a bit this step here, which is now discussed a bit in more detail. How to compute the loss and how does the loss look like?
If we talk about loss, we can talk about loss of a single example x. It's a so-called pointwise loss. For this, we use the small letter L. And this loss depends on the ground truth and what we do with this. And we can discuss a so-called zero one loss, which says correctly classified or not, which is hard to train. This is a function we cannot differentiate. Or we can do something like the squared loss or the logistic loss or the uh, cross entropy loss. There's a question. Can we use the loss function to check how close or far we are from the optimization of that question? Yes, for a simple ex for a single example, we use the loss for a single example, we use the loss function to find uh, out how close this example is to the ground truth. If we do this for all examples, this is a global loss function. You will see it in a minute. It's so only the addition of all pointwise losses. We find out how far we are from the optimum. This is the only difference. This is a single pointwise loss. And we have to think about how do we compute the loss. We have a difference. And the zero one loss is very hard. Is this completely true or completely wrong? While the squared loss says we take the difference and square it. And if we do this for all, I repeat myself here, we get the global loss. And this tells us something about the distance from the optimum. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we always have a gradient that looks a little bit like uh, this Gaussian curve? Or could we also have multiple optimums? Yeah, normally the question was how our gradient looks like. And this is also something I would like you to, to think about in the future. This is why we do this here, that you that the gradient hull, this, this, this carpet, this green carpet, gets an idea in your head. And um, normally we, this can have is a very complex function in a high dimensional space and we cannot imagine it so rarely, um, but in certain situations we can imagine it. It is not uh, a convex function in the complicated case. However, um, because it's so important, I would like to go to this point. This is really important stuff. Here, if we do things like this, or in the kernel trick with the SVMs, or other feature transformations, the the loss um, the, the the loss hull, this this green carpet is always a convex function. This is very important to see that to understand that means support vector machines or this kind of nonlinear um, um, basis expansions and other things, they have a unique optimum. This is a big difference to, to, to uh, if you start with neural networks in its generic sense. If you go to a multi-layer perceptron, this is gone, this story. And hence, this is always the, the, the discussion uh, how complex should we become with our learning function? Of course, I can always use a deep learning model to do something simple, but I, I would lose getting a person who is really smart and understands the situation and says, we go with support vector machines in a kernel space, he will, he will beat you by far. Okay. We are not more or less done. We, we, we come to our last building block, the loss functions. Um, there are loss functions for classification. There are loss functions for regression. However, this, this line is not so strict because we use loss functions for regression to do classification. But, but anyway, if you read the books, you should, should know this. And there are more loss functions than which that those we show here. But those which show here are, show all principles that you have to understand. And if you understand these, you understand the others as well. This here is this here. That means I want you now to understand we are look, looking onto the input space. 
into the input space is some, let's say, tentative boundary. And we will ask now ourselves, what is about the loss with, which is connected to this boundary? Now, uh, we want you to understand the following, because these are drawings which you'll see very often. We want you to understand this. We now switch from looking down. Here we look down onto the input space. By turning this view, this is a bit complicated to understand is what we do here. It's uh, two rotations, namely, I cannot uh, show it, demonstrate you so easy. We, we flip this input space by 90 degrees. And then if you see this movement here, becomes this movement here. And we want to look you like through a pipe, through this green line. And here is the pipe. I don't know whether you get this. This is not so easy to understand this here, but this is important to understand. If you can take time, the rotations are shown here. Um, the, again, the first is the input space. And when, then we now, we look, we return this and we look in, into the direction of this line. And now we see this blue regression function. The blue regression function, sorry, right. is this here. Yeah, now we see, we look here, exactly here to this point. This is a regression function. And now we measure the distance of the regression function from this plane. And this here, this in fact, this is a loss. Or let's say this is a residuum. And from this, I want to pre be precise here, we compute the loss. And what the last hyper, uh, figure shows and these are the figures that you see quite often in, in the blog posts. Here we see the discrimination point. This is this point here. And here we see our loss function evaluates, assesses the distance from the hyperplane and the loss. If you, what we here see is the loss for a, a, a positive example. And if the positive example is on the wrong side, it has a high loss. If it's on the right side, it is a zero loss. This is a zero one loss, which we see here. And this is a squared loss, for instance, which we see here. And I could also show you different losses, but um, I know that they are not so easy to read these graphics and you have to, 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 to take the time to, to do this. But an algorithm measures this distance here and then gives an example, depending on the loss function, the pointwise loss, and these values are all added. And then it compares the slight change of this line here and looks what then happens with these functions. And from this information, the algorithm gets a gradient and knows in which direction to go. And if you've got more or less the idea, then I can tell you that's all. Uh, it does not become more complicated, I promise you. Yeah. This is a, a last building block for understanding how we get from the examples, the model functions, the residuals and the loss to the total loss. And by varying this vector W, we get the gradient. Okay, um, for the, this, perhaps it's a good um, time to, to make a short break or to, to ask the audience if there are any questions.
because it's easy now to, to go further and further, but um, it doesn't make sense uh, at the moment, I would say. For me, it would, uh, it would be nice if you would understand, would you have understood what, what the five building blocks or four building blocks which, which, which we had by now? Michael, is there information which you would like to add here? Uh, at the moment, not really. I think uh, if you understand everything up to here and uh, you should really make sure that you do and ask questions if there are things that are still open, then you are in a good position to um, go further with the fundamentals and to ultimately become very proficient at this stuff. Uh, I, I see you raised, raised hand. hand. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I have a question about um, whether or not I understood the, the illustration from input space to hyperplane uh, correctly. Um, yeah. So if the, if the x's out, the, the pluses and the minus would be exactly the same in the middle, then there should also be a green plus on the bottom line, right? Or Yeah, exactly. You see, okay. you see, you see the green plus here, which is among the red. And you see this is here, this here. Again, the here, I don't know. Okay, yeah, thanks ah, for yeah, painting. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there. Yeah, there. Um, if, if you, I don't know whether you can see me. If, if you take this plan and, and uh, turn this by 90 degrees, then you have all pluses and minus in, into one line. Yeah? And uh, the minus below here and the plus is here. Because, sorry. Yeah, you see the minus uh, at the bottom, the pluses are there. And we took this, this look, but normally the pluses are up. And if we now swap them, okay, where is it? We take, I take a new drawing, this is also nice. <laughs> it's the same thing. Um, if you now swap them, you see the minus at zero and the pluses at one. Maybe to further clear up this misconception, you could add that the y-axis in the second plot is the ground truth label. So there's no chance for yeah, wrong labelings there. So the plus must be at uh, y label one. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This is uh, there. Is uh, this is there? Um, this here is for the linear function model function. This is for the logistic model function. The model function is um, non-linear, of course, but the learned classifier is linear. Don't be confused with this. Because uh, the hyperplane, which the classifier learns, is a linear hyperplane. And the hyperplane is linear by, by definition. So, right. okay. And again, you see here um, what the algorithm sees, and you see if the you look at the logistic loss. This is a red, which I now go over here. Yeah. The the farther you go away from the hyperplane, the closer it gets to zero. It's very smooth. And the zero one loss, which you see here, though it is perfect, it cannot be used in the gradient descent. This is a problem. Yeah? In the gradient descent, you need a gradient. And this function, the yellow function is not differentiable. This is the reason why we use such differentiable functions. And uh, the idea is to develop uh, loss functions which imitate the zero one loss, but are differentiable. And there have a few very smart functions be developed. Maybe something to add here. Um, the sigmoid function that you saw earlier is very often used in your networks as an activation function because it is very, very easy, easily differentiable um, and very fast to compute the derivatives. So it kind of makes for an efficient network. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, then um, this closes the loss thing. I will now. Illustrate overfitting. This is the last element promised for today. After overfitting comes regularization and rate descent and uh, multi-layer perceptrons, which we do next week. I would like to talk about overfitting because you learned it already. Lucas mentioned it, um, the pooling strategy against overfitting and uh, other things can be done against overfitting, and we would like you to understand what overfitting is. That was means. The, the dropout, I think, against overfitting. Ah, it was, it was dropout, it was not pooling. Yeah, yeah, pooling was uh, the addition of this line. Thank you. Um, it, um, somehow we have an idea what overfitting is. Overfitting means being too precise and fail in an certain other situations because of this precision. But um, the definition is also not too complicated, and I want to demonstrate this here. Before you read this, uh, I can directly illustrate this here. What the algorithm sees, or what we can let give us from the algorithm, is the error which decreases during the learning thing. This is very nice. The algorithm is happy and happy. And it, uh, it, it just changes here in the x-axis the w vector, which is called h for hypothesis here. And it changes it, and with new each improvement, the error becomes smaller. What the problem here could be that the error on the set where the algorithm is trained on, the error in fact becomes smaller, but in the wild, that means in reality, the algorithm does not work because this happens. This, let's say, is data which the algorithm hasn't seen. This is data which the algorithm has seen. And what we want to have is an algorithm that behaves equally well. This is a secret on data which has seen and not seen. And an algorithm which does this not is called to overfit. And this is explained here. If, we, if our error is smaller for a certain age, on the data we have seen, then on unseen data, which is called the truth here, then we overfit. And this is also the way we measure this. And the operationalization of this idea is to create a certain holdout effect. Um, set or to do another sampling strategy where we do not present the learning algorithm everything. We say we have a test set which we reserve, which we keep hidden, and we have a training set which we give the algorithm. And we, the, the set which we um, do not show the algorithm, the test set is shown yellow here. In practice, we have, in fact, three sets, a test set, a training set, and a validation set. The validation set helps us to optimize the training. But the basic idea is what you see here. We keep data away. And if the result data has the same or similar error, like the training data, as long as this is the case here, we do not overfit. And this was the last element which Michael and me thought about to present you today. And now I think we have shown you a lot and I hope you enjoyed it a bit and you understood also most of it. And um, uh, next uh, week we will continue awesome. with multi-layer perceptrons. The week after this, we will then directly go to um, the deep learning networks, recurrent neural networks. That means uh, there is some kind of fast recap, it's more than a recap next week, and then two um, courses, sessions on deep learning networks.
directly. But we thought it makes sense only to bring this theory of deep learning only if you know all these this, uh, ideas of regression, of loss, of uh, gradient descent, of overfitting and regularization, because they all play a role when you work with the API. Okay, that's all from my side. I want to say thank you. Thank you also for supporting me here and uh, Yannick and on, on your side, Lucas, Martin and Michael. And I'm um, still open for questions. And if there are no questions, we, we see us next week. Yes, uh, thank you, Benno. Um, I guess we can leave the session open uh, for the lab um, and then just return in half an hour um, for Chris's presentation of having face models. Thank you, Lucas. I would also say um, we, we like it very much, the idea to have the series uh, line and um, strand and this practical strand, and they combine uh, very well. Only theory is really boring. Only API handling does not bring you further in, in your development. So, so you can take your private mix from this. Yeah. Okay. Then I say goodbye to... Leipzig for today from my side and um, yeah, we see us later. Bye bye. See you and thank you. Uh, see you for all the see others. You. See you again at half past three, so in twenty-five minutes. See you then. <laughs>